Welcome back, everyone. We have an update from Clean Inc. It trades on the NASDAQ under the symbol CLNN. It's a late stage clinical stage biopharmaceutical company focused on improving mitochondrial health and protecting neuronal function to treat neurodegenerative diseases. Happy to welcome President and CEO Rob Etherington. Welcome, Rob. We're happy to hear your update. Thank you, Anna. It's a pleasure to be here and to see everybody virtually at least, on this uh, hopefully pleasant July day for most of you, though I certainly recognize that the eastern seaboard has been slammed with a lot of rain of late. Uh, where I am, though, uh, in Utah, it's presently beautifully sunny outside, and I wish that you all have a good rest of July. Uh, Clean just met with the agency in June. We announced this um, just the 4th of July week, and that enabled a very clear plan for our analysis of neurofilament, the biomarker neurofilament. Now, I think, Anna, for your listeners, let me just give an update of that. Um, when the disease ALS attacks the neuron, it leaves a debris field in the bloodstream, and that debris field can be measured. It's a cytoskeletal protein remainder of what's called neurofilament light. So similar to how Glucose might be a measure of diabetes problems. Cholesterol might be a measure, a biomarker measure of cardiovascular problems. High neurofilament levels is a biomarker or an indicator of ALS challenges in the neuron. So what you and I and all the human family relies upon for this choreography of life that enables us to move and walk and talk and eat and chew and breathe, that is driven by neurons. And so what we've done is the FDA has proposed that we evaluate the neurofilament um, effect of CNMA U8, that is, can it drop neurofilament in an ALS patient? So if compromised neurofilament is rising because the neurofilament is leaching from destroyed neuron into the bloodstream, and our CNMA U8 drug that we take by mouth orally can reduce neurofilament, that's very indicative of a clinical benefit. And so we have uh, levered the $45 million that the NIH gave us, bless them, um, and that's funding uh, 180 subjects, um, individuals, participants, people who struggle with ALS, said most, um, you know, more specifically, uh, it has enabled them to be on drug now for at least six months, and in many cases up to a year. And CLEAN will be evaluating the neurofilament change of these individuals beginning next month through till September. Why I say that time period is because we, uh, per the FDA's request, had to get all of these individuals to at least six months of therapy, which has just happened this month. And so what we're doing is evaluating that, and we'll be submit, send, submitting that data back to the agency and if it is concordant, that is, it says the same story, expresses the same argument that we saw in the double-blind um, placebo-controlled HELI program, then we've asked the agency if we could submit this data consistent with HELI as a new drug application for the possibility of accelerated approval in ALS. Now, secondary to this, and not, you know, one could argue primarily to this, not secondarily, we've submitted a whole separate dossier to the FDA on survival alone, because we achieved the secondary endpoint in the Healy point on the 30 milligram dose for survival reduction. And we've also announced earlier this year um, survival against a concurrent control, regimen A, that also showed a concordant or similar survival benefit. So we've submitted this dossier to the FDA, and we have a meeting, as we announced, um, the 4th of July week, it also in the third quarter to discuss this. So whether the FDA lets us um, uh, put forward a new drug application based upon neurofilament or survival or both is a conversation that we'll be very much looking forward to having with the FDA over the course of the next 90 days. Wonderful. Congratulations with that. Can you talk about when you might anticipate having new data and a little bit more on filing that new drug application? Well, this data that I just spoke of is all coming to us uh, in in the very latter part of the third quarter. And so that data will be submitted to the FDA in the top of the fourth quarter with the ability, as we're planning and preparing, the filing of this new drug application by the end of the year. And so the way this works at the FDA is then they would take all that data. It then becomes a review that they that they proceed with over the course of 60 to 70 odd days, which means that um, in the first quarter of 2020, 
six, we would find out if that new drug application is accepted. So literally, it's a very busy period over the next um, five months at Clean, and then uh, a very busy period waiting for the FDA's decisions in the first quarter of 2026. So within nine months from now, we will have good clarity about the possibility of whether or not our drug is accepted for a complete review in ALS, that is uh, uh, for the treatment of CNMA U8 in ALS um, uh, individuals. Perfect. Talk a little bit about your plans for a phase three clinical trial in terms of timing and design for the ALS indication. So the way accelerated approval works in the FDA's case is there needs to be a confirmatory phase three. So if accelerated approval is accepted based upon surrogate biomarkers, and again, the surrogate biomarkers we're talking about here is neural filament and or a survival conversation or both, then we need to nonetheless start uh, a phase three study. And that phase three is planned to be primary and pointed on survival, that is time to event. So we've taken a page out of uh, oncology or cancer clinical studies, a page out of cardiovascular studies, and we're literally looking to see if uh, patients who take uh, CNMA U8 are living longer than the placebo individuals. That's called a time to event study. And that study we're planning to commence um, with first patients on drug uh, at the latter part of this year. We've already received permission in the first regulatory market um, to proceed with that study, and we'll be having investigator meetings shortly. And then that study will continue more broadly in a global fashion in 2026. Our viewer, Matt, asks, for how long does the neurofilament remain in the bloodstream? And after the reduction, has there been any regeneration? Uh, so to answer the first question, neurofilament elevation shows up before actually individuals who struggle with ALS uh, start presenting clinical symptom symptoms. So in other words, if you were to measure my uh, neurofilament right now, um, I would pray that my neurofilament would be um, undetectable. That is that my neurons are doing their job. If you, I'm still functional, more or less, I can do everything I'd like to do. Um, uh, I just hit 59, so I have the inevitable, you know, nearly almost 60 aches and pains. But other than that, I'm doing fine. And uh, But if, if my neurofilm was rising and I had that blood test, I would think, uh-oh, batten down the hatches. Clinical effects are about to hit me. So to answer Matt's question, um, uh, yes, uh, neurofilament uh, does still stay elevated unless uh, clean remains, by the way, the only drug in a phase two double-blind placebo-controlled study that has shown a reduction in neurofilament. Um, and then the second part of Matt's question for how long does it remain in the bloodstream? And after the reduction, has there been regeneration? Ah, so we don't know the regeneration in the case of ALS yet, but we've just presented data at the American um, Academy of Neurology in April that suggests that we're both remyelinating uh, a damaged neuron and we are uh, protecting the neuron that has been compromised. So we've seen return of effect through paraclinical biomarkers using MRI and visual vote potentials in the MS population. We have not yet uh, concluded that same work in ALS. We've been focused, you know, frankly, on, on all the things we're doing in ALS otherwise, but we do see it in MS. So it, 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 there could be a correlation in ALS as well, but we don't know for sure scientifically. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the CNMAU8, what it's being investigated primarily for? Is it one indication or multiple indications? So the way we think about this is a little bit of a pipeline in a product, as we call it, because the uh, MS data is actually being discussed with the agency also this quarter. We mentioned that as well in our, uh, our, our June 30th update. So in other words, we have three meetings with the FDA that are face-to-face, um, on uh, either of ALS two meetings or MS one. And the MS discussion is what's called an end of phase two meeting. Uh, we've just uh, sent them uh, all of our dossier on our multiple sclerosis program. It was the same dose, same drug that we're talking about in the case of ALS. So that's why we talk about this a little bit as a pipeline and a product. And mechanistically, um, the way this drug is working is it's, it's driving the energetic return to the flailing or failing mitochondria, which is the energy powerhouse of the neuron or the cell, and that's driving what the neuron's doing. And so to, to be able to provide back the energetic metabolite support that the energy that the mitochondria needs to basically get its gas 
and its engine going, speaking colloquially, is very important. And so um, we also have uh, concluded Parkinson's work already. We did Rett syndrome and early preclinical data a year ago. Um, there is a whiteboard down the hall in my office here that has Huntington's and frontal temporal dementia, et cetera, all as possibilities. And I can go into other neurodegenerative diseases. But at the moment, our key clinical focus has been MS and ALS with this early insight also into Parkinson's. Well, fantastic update. Great work. And please continue to do this important work for all of our viewers. It's clean on the NASDAQ CLNN. Rob, thank you for your update today. Thank you. All right, everyone. We'll be right back.